we are moving into the skeletal system. And really, today we're talking about bone, which is familiar. You've seen bone already. In lab one, you looked at slides of bone tissue, and you understood, you, uh, you learned the, the parts of at least compact bone. And we're going to review that mainly today, because that leads into the skeleton. Bone is the tissue of the skeleton how the skeleton is set up, and then how it interfaces with muscle to produce movements. So the skeleton on its own doesn't move. Muscle on its own, it can move, but it won't produce any meaningful motion. Both of them together are required to um, move limbs, contract, wave your arms while you're speaking, to speak, period. Both of these systems work in tandem. So we'll start with the skeletal system, understand how that's organized, and then add the muscular system afterwards. But we need to briefly recap the last section. We didn't include a summary on the, uh, on the last set of slides when we left class on Tuesday. So you've heard about this at length. I just want to remind you that membrane potential simply means the inside is more negative than the outside of a neuron. Most excitable cells will exhibit this characteristic. And resting membrane potential is around minus 70 millivolts. You should have a firm understanding of how membrane potential is produced, how it's maintained. The uh, differential separation of sodium and potassium. And we always maintain that with the action of leak channels and sodium potassium pumps. And from that resting state, the neuron that we're looking at can be influenced by any signals it receives. And those signals are graded potentials that push membrane potential up or down. Up being more positive, down being more negative up being more inclined to depolarize, down being hyperpolarized and inactivated. If it gets high enough and reaches a threshold, then an action potential is triggered. The action potential is triggered at the axon hillock. It has a fixed on or off strength, has a fixed amplitude, and it travels the length of the axon to the end terminals uh, the, uh, the synaptic end bulbs of the neuron. If it's triggered, it will send a signal. To get around the inconvenience of having just a fixed amplitude, what if we need to send an urgent signal or just a small light hint of a signal? We can modify the strength of our signals using spatial and temporal summation. We can have more neurons converge on one distal target, spatial summation, sending many signals at once. Or temporal, one neuron can fire rapidly, also sending many signals at once, but from simply one source. That's how we amplify the action potential, or the, uh, the signal sent by a nerve. That's how we activate the muscle, to contract it, to create a lever, to shorten the angle at a joint. Joints are made of bone. We're leading naturally into the next two sections. And I hope you appreciate, too, the, uh, we've come full circle. We talked about resting potential Graded potentials from somewhere upstream will influence it. A signal is sent. And that signal makes a new graded potential in the next neuron. And it starts all over again. What's really interesting to think about is how does the first graded potential ever get produced? I'm going to decide to lift my arm. How did I initiate that signal? How did that first neuron fire? It didn't receive any graded potentials. 
I'm going to leave it there. I'll let you think about that. It's a big picture question that you can mull over. Let's move on to our study of bone. We think of bone as this rigid, hard structure. But bone is, yes, it is rigid and it's hard, but it's flexible and it's sensitive. It's innervated by nerves. There is high blood supply in return. Bone is a continually um, remodeling tissue. It's always in turnover. It's not fixed, even though it seems that way because we always stand up straight. Our arms are always the same length normally. We don't shrink and then grow on an hourly or daily basis. We think of bones as being very static. So in this section, I want to look at just the structure of a bone. Let's isolate one before we put the skeleton together. What are the parts of a bone? We'll look at the structures and functions of each part of a long bone specifically, but know that there are other kinds of bones too. We're going to look at the myriad different kinds of bones, but the long bone is what we think of when you think bone. Bones are created, they develop and grow, they ossify by two main processes, intramembranous and endochondral ossification. I'm going to outline those briefly, but you will get an in-depth look at those processes in lab, at least endochondral. They're very similar. There's one small difference that we'll talk about uh, today. I expect you to know the processes in a fair bit of detail, the detail that you'll see in lab, for instance, but I'm not going to repeat what you'll, uh, what you'll learn in lab. We'll outline the process in general, and you'll get detail in lab. Lastly, we will set up bones in a system. Bones together as the skeleton have some degree of organization too. We, uh, we classify the skeleton differently. And so different parts of the skeleton um, interface with different bones, have different actions, and broadly you can consider yourself a T-shape. You've got one main axis that's vertical, one main axis that's horizontal or coming off of the vertical. And we broadly separate the skeleton into axial, the vertical portion, and appendicular, the appendices of the axial skeleton. So that's our outline. And this will last probably today, maybe half of tomorrow. It's not going to be a long, uh, a long set of slides. You'll see on Moodle there are two different sets, this and then one that prefaces muscle tissue. So let's look at bone, bone tissue specifically. Aw, right? This is often what we think of when we think bone. This is what this dog dreams of on a daily basis. It's made up of not just calcified mineral salts, but it has dense connective tissue, adipose tissue, nervous tissue, no muscular tissue in bone, but it is closely associated with muscles. So many different tissue types. It's not as simple as you might think. Well, you don't think it's simple now, having been introduced to it, but someone that's unfamiliar with bone might think, oh, it's just calcium, a tube of calcium. That's not the case. There is an abundant extracellular matrix, which is the, the mineral salts and the lattice work that allow that hard, rigid structure to be supported. There's an abundant extracellular matrix, and it's made up mostly of um, crystallized mineral salts, specifically calcium, some phosphate. Collagen is in play, which gives bone its flexibility. If you dissolved all the calcium and mineral salts away from bone, it would be floppy. And that's because of the, the collagen. And then some water. 
We're going to focus just on one bone specifically, or a theoretical uh, candidate bone, but when you put all of the bones in the body together, that's what makes up the skeleton. So that's coming in the second half. We're focusing just on one bone uh, as an example right now. Now what should a bone and what should the skeleton do? What do these tissues, what does this system do for us? The first and most obvious is that it provides support. Well, it's a rigid tissue. It's stiff. It provides structure. It is the uh, scaffolding on which the body is built. It supports. What does it support? It supports muscles. It supports connective tissue and um, other tissues. It supports the internal organs. The brain is held up by bone. Well, specifically, it's held up by the cerebrospinal fluid. It floats in CSF, but that's contained within bone. All the internal organs, the heart, the intestines, the liver, they're encased in and supported by foundational bones in the skeleton. Bones not only support and protect, but they allow movement because of how they're arranged and how they interface. Two neighboring bones can move in relation to each other. They can articulate. They don't do it on their own, but in conjunction with muscles or under the influence of muscle tissue. Now, I would say that these are the main roles of bone and the skeleton. Primary roles, if you will. Secondary roles, and maybe it's just because I'm uninformed, but they provide a depot, a depot to store and release minerals if needed. They can take up excess minerals. Some can be let out into the circulation if required. It helps to maintain mineral homeostasis. Calcium and phosphorus specifically because those are the two main minerals that make up bone tissue. I'm immediately regretting saying these are secondary effects because this next one is pretty important. Bone is where red blood cells are produced. Red blood cells that contain hemoglobin, that circulate through the arteries and veins, that bind oxygen and deliver it to tissues, they're produced in the marrow of long bones. Which is really interesting, if you think about it. Produced in the marrow of long bones, released into the veins that uh, drain the bones and then circulate through the body. The bones you don't think of as being part of the, uh, the, uh, the blood or as contributing to the homeostasis and constituents of the blood. Red, bo uh, red bone marrow specifically will produce um, those structures, red blood cells, and respond to some hormones that are interesting. We'll talk about those later. Yellow marrow in the bones is a um, large source of fat and triglycerides. And it's not so much a concern now, but in the past when we would often be starved, we would want to release energy from these depots. Triglycerides from, uh, from bone marrow would fuel some other tissues in the body if needed. There's also some hormones that are released, but I'm going to leave that till we get to the endocrine section at the end, which we'll hopefully have time for. So varied functions, more than you imagined before you learned about bone or before you came to class today, probably. We are going to take the first couple and run with them over the next few sections. We're not going to talk at length about four, five, and six. This week and next week, we are talking about one, two, and three. So let's look at the structure of bone. Maybe you didn't notice on the, the first background slide, on our outline slide, that 
This is a Capela de Osos in Portugal, or Chapel of Bones. I got to visit here uh, a couple years ago in 2014, and the it is it is a, an impactful visit to say the least. But this is a, a chapel made almost entirely of bones, some plaster, some cement. But you can see a a piling of many different long bones in the uh, in the openings off to the side. The uh, the pillars are covered in bones as well. If you're ever in Portugal, I would suggest going there. It's pretty uh, pretty interesting. So imagine we take one of these bones down off the shelf, so to speak. They are one of many. There are many different kinds. We think of the long bones typically when you think of bone, but there are five different types of bone as shown here. Long bone is the humerus or the femur or the tibia. These are all names that you'll learn eventually as we get to those sections. A long bone is long and cylindrical, mostly. This should probably just read greater length than width. I'm not sure why the word seed is in there. It shouldn't be in there. Long bones are long and cylindrical, as indicated on the top left of this figure. They are one of five different types. They're what we're going to study today. The other bones are short or cube-shaped. You'll find these often um, in the hands or small, fine joints. Flat bones of the skull. Flat bones of the sternum not cylindrical, they're not cube-shaped, they're a sheet of bone. Thin layers of parallel plates. We'll briefly look at those as we talk about the processes of bone formation. We're going to come back to irregular bones after we introduce the skeleton as a whole. We're going to look at the vertebral column. And we've already mentioned the vertebral column as the structure that encases and protects the spinal cord. But these are characteristic in their use of irregular bones. It's not a cube. It's not a cylinder. There's projections every which way. You might think that looks like something. Kind of looks like an animal. We'll come back to that later. And the last uh, example are sesamoid bones, or pinched, cone-shaped bones. These might also be a subtype of flat bone, but they're generally seed-shaped or rounder. Maybe that's where the word seed came from in that uh, is an era of transfer. They're pinched at one end, rounded. They have a, a curved shape, somewhat flat. The patella is an example of a sesamoid bone. There's also one in your wrist that you can palpate, you can feel, just off to the side. Talk about those as we get there. But let's ignore the other bones and focus only on a long bone for now. Long bone is characteristic of these other bones, and it has the most easily identifiable substructure. It's easy to point to the parts of a bone in a long bone. It's hard to do it in an irregular bone. So let's use the long bone as our candidate bone. Being long and cylindrical, having a greater length than width, the column is the diaphysis. The column, the long part in the middle, is the diaphysis. And these all share the same root, physis, the word. I don't actually know what it comes from. I usually look those things up, but all of the parts share physis. And then the, uh, the prefix is somewhat different to indicate where you're looking in the bone. Diaphysis is the, uh, the main column or shaft of bone. At the ends, we're going to jump from the column in the middle all the way to the ends, the book ends of the bone, the epiphyses. One epiphysis, two epiphyses, and these are specifically the regions that articulate with other bones. They touch the next bone or the neighboring bone. Epiphyses are at the very tips of a long bone. And the part in between them, for lack of a better word, is metaphyses. 
one metaphysis, two metaphyses. This region is specifically important when we think about the growth of bone. We're going to come back to this in detail. When bones grow in length, they do so at the metaphyses. One diaphysis in the middle bracketed by two epiphyses on the far ends, separated by metaphyses between those two. The main structure of bone is as follows, or as we, as we mentioned. Now, some other interesting characteristics. In order for bone to articulate and not be painful, the ends of the bone are covered in articular cartilage. So the epiphyses at the very ends of the bone are not just bone, but they have a, a thick, durable layer of articular cartilage that allows those surfaces to glide over top of each other. If you've ever, ever heard of someone having um, pain, joint pain, because their cartilage is worn down, or uh, from repetition injuries as an athlete, maybe you've experienced some of this, it's really painful when the cartilage wears away and bone grinds on bone. Cartilage doesn't grow back very easily, if at all. So cartilage, really important in allowing the articulation of long bones. You can see that highlighted in blue on the top and the bottom. Some articular cartilages are larger than others, and the shape is somewhat irregular. We'll see why that shape when we get to the, uh, when we get to the upper limb. This is the humerus, by the way, your upper arm bone. And that bone tissue, you would have seen these coverings before, surrounded by periosteum, a layer around the outside of bone. You can see a flap being lifted off here. The inside is surrounded by endosteum, an internal layer. And that internal cavity is called the medullary cavity, uh, cavity, or medullary cavity. I call it medullary. The hollow space within the bone where marrow is stored. Bones aren't just static. They're not fixed. They're hollow. They're porous. They're light. This is one of the reasons that these can be light and then also bend and be resilient, too. cavity along the inside is lined with a very similar layer of connective tissue, endosteum, because it's inside, periosteum is outside. So this is an itemized list of facts. There's no rhyme or reason here yet. These are the parts of a bone that are important to know moving forward. One other Honorable mention goes to this really interesting arc that you can see. I mentioned the metaphysis when I talked about bone growth. This arc is really important in that process. It's called the epiphyseal line. It, um, we'll see it as it grows. Um, as you become an adult, it fuses. Uh, we'll talk about that coming up. But the epiphyseal line is an important feature to note on this slide as well, even though I don't have it written down. That's the site of bone growth. Now you can see, if you look at the, uh, the top portion of this bone, this speckled appearance, uh, a general hard white line on the outside and a speckled appearance on the inside, which uh, describes the two types of bones that you're already familiar with. You know what compact bone is. You know the organization of cells in compact bone. This is the type of bone tissue that's very durable and hard that provides support. And it often encases or surrounds spongy bone. And spongy bone isn't spongy necessarily. It's just porous. There are many holes and chambers. It has the appearance of a sponge. It's still made of bone tissue. There are still osteocytes in spongy bone. But this is the porous, more lightweight bone tissue within a long bone. The bubbles inside an arrow bar. 
compact bone and spongy bone, both often associated together. Compact bone wraps around, spongy bone is inside, allowing pathways for nerves, pathways for blood vessels, uh, for marrow to sit, etc. On the point of blood vessels and nerves, on the point of blood vessels and nerves. There are a few important ones to note. Fewer than are listed here. There are many nutrient arteries, perforating arteries, epiphyseal arteries, and corresponding veins. I don't want you to know all of these arteries and veins, but simply appreciate how extensive the vascularization of bone is on this slide how far-reaching all the arteries and veins go. They're everywhere in bone tissue. From the outside in, there are small periosteal arteries that supply the compact bone and keep that rigid, keep it healthy. Those are obviously the ones that you'll see when you look at the outside surface of a bone, but they're not the most important as far as supply to the bone goes. We're going to come back a number of times, you'll see it in the lab as well, to nutrient arteries. Nutrient arteries are the big arteries that pierce through compact bone into the medullary cavity and supply uh, arterial blood to the majority of the parts of the long bone. So the nutrient artery you can see uh, here piercing the periosteum. It pierces into the compact bone and extends superior and inferior inside the medullary cavity, giving off branches as it goes to support that tissue. And for our purposes, the nutrient arteries and its branches uh, support the diaphysis, the main part of the bone. All the structures in the bone will be uh, mostly supported by nutrient arteries. The ends of the bones are supplied differently. The epiphyses are supplied differently. Epiphyses on the end, epiphyseal arteries supply the epiphyses. Seems like I'm throwing a lot of names at you, but this name tells you exactly where to look and what it does. The epiphyseal and branches of the epiphyseal, the metaphyseal arteries will supply the ends of the long bones. Nutrient supplies the, the large majority in the middle, epiphyseal on the ends and then the periosteal, the outside covering of the bone tissue. There is more detail, but that's what I want you to take away from this for now. These will be important in the supply of nutrients to support bone growth. They'll be important in watching how they, uh, they distribute through the bone and the process of bone growth. And you'll see this in detail in lab. So nutrient arteries, epiphyseal arteries, and small perforating arteries. Let's talk about bone growth. If we assume that the uh, blood supply is large and constant, it's pervasive within the bone, how does that support bone growth? This also is an adult bone, so we want to think of how do we get to that position? How do we get to that situation? And I'll do a brief recap. This is not something you need to scramble to write down. You know this in detail, I think, already. Many different kinds of bone cells. As a brief primer or refresher, you remember the osteoprogenitor cells are stem cells that develop into other types of cells. They develop into osteoblasts, which you know build bone, lay down the matrix, crystallize the matrix, and help with bone growth. In a mature adult, 
uh, bone, those cells are osteocytes, sit in the lacunae, extend out tentacles to maintain the matrix nearby. And on the other side of the equation, osteoclasts dissolve bone tissue, break down bone, get rid of the matrix, dissolve it in order to use those nutrients elsewhere or because we don't need that tissue and it's redundant. Similarly, these are all familiar. This should be familiar. You have a pretty in-depth understanding of the structure of compact bone. You know what an osteon is. And the central canal carrying uh, arteries and veins. We're going to look at how the, how the compact bone grows not only lengthwise but also in thickness or diameter. And so understanding this structure is important to understand uh, how we add that extra layer on top of our understanding. So you know the organized structure of the, uh, the osteons. They organize in length or in the direction of the stress placed upon them. If I'm standing on my leg bones, the osteons are lined up in the direction of the force being applied. So from bottom to top, there are many columns within the bone that help to support my weight. And then as I look into the center, the medullary cavity would be over here on the left, you start to see some of that spongy bone appear. It's not spongy in, in that it's flexible, it just looks to have more holes, it's more, it contains more air, more stuff, it's not as compact. There are more uh, channels here for nutrients, nerves, and uh, arteries to wind around. This is where the, uh, the marrow is held. So that shouldn't be anything new. But what we're going to talk about that's new is how bone structure changes. So far you've seen those slides and it's been fixed. An osteon is an osteon is an osteon. An osteocyte sits in its lacuna, it's bored. How does the structure change? And the, the structure is always changing. We just always tend to do the same things, and so we don't notice an appreciable difference in the rigidity and structure and shape of our bones. But if you took an extreme vacation, didn't walk around, play sports, maybe went to outer space, you'd notice some pretty extreme changes in the structure of your bone tissue. So the process of changing... When I think about changing, um, growth of bones is osteogenesis, and they really only occur in four main conditions. When you are young or developing in the embryonic phase, they can grow to um, an adolescent size. Through adolescence to maturity, they grow in length and build upon the existing structure. When bones remodel, they are also required to grow. That is, if we apply regular, uh, regular repeated stress to the bones, um, normally the, uh, the osteons are lined up in the direction of force. I always stand on my legs, so they're always vertical. If I did something different and always lied down, I wouldn't need to maintain vertical osteons. They might change. Or if uh, my gait changed, and the angle of, um, of my stride changes as I walk on the ground. I might change the angle of the osteons within my bone. That's remodeling. Or when bone breaks. And we aren't spending a lot of time on fractures. There are courses that you'll see that talk about uh, fractures, uh, splints, braces, healing of bone tissue. That's not for this course yet. We are just understanding the basic processes. Bones always remodel. They're always being broken down and they're always being built up. We just always require them to support our weight, which is why we don't notice change. In space, there's severe atrophy. Muscles shrink. You're not working against gravity. You don't need to maintain really strong leg bones. And so your body will make use of those minerals elsewhere. 
Now, growth of bone occurs according to two plans. There are two programs. And these programs are initiated depending on where you are in the body and what type of bone you're trying to produce. And they're broadly separated into, are you making a flat bone or are you making a long bone? Maybe I'll say flat bone and not a flat bone, because it would also be irregular bones that are produced by endochondral, uh, endochondral ossification. So intramembranous ossification forms flat sheets of bone. Endochondral ossification forms columnar long bones. And I'll briefly outline each of these. Maybe I'll only outline one today because we are approaching the end of class. I don't want to scramble to catch up and overload you with too much. We'll talk about one, and then we'll finish up the rest tomorrow. So intramembranous ossification, we'll start with first. We replace a sheet of connective tissue with bone. You will have this schematic in your notes that has somewhat more detail in the bubbles on the slide. And we'll follow the bubbles in order as we do our discussion now. But the main points that I want you to understand are uh, in the bubbles that I'll bring up. Every bone starts with an ossification center. Osteoblasts get together, they start to secrete signals to create a matrix. When many of them aggregate, their combined influence creates what's called an ossification center, a center of accelerated bone growth, a center of accelerated mineral deposition. Now, what causes the osteoblast to get together in this center is not important right now, but you will see that in lab. There's a really nice uh, series of animated lectures that uh, I know Kathleen will be happy to lead you through. So we have osteoblasts that get together to lay down the extracellular matrix. As they lay down that matrix and it expands outwards, they're engulfed. They, they get encased inside the matrix, and it starts to crystallize and harden. We have the root, or the seed, of bone tissue. This is bone tissue as it grows outward in length and in thickness. From one small ossification center outwards. So the osteoblasts are engulfed. Calcium and phosphate are laid down and used to help crystallize the matrix. So you can imagine one of these centers growing. If there's another center nearby, that's also growing. If there are a number of different centers in a row along this membranous sheet and they all grow together, eventually as they grow, they will reach their projections will reach neighboring ossification centers. And we like to think of them as growing uniformly, but the way that they grow and the orientation of these centers in space means that when they connect, when they touch neighboring centers, they make these columns. These, these projections end up being columns in space, and there's lots of air and uh, empty space between them. And these columns are what we refer to as trabeculae. Trabeculae are piles of connective tissue or columns of connective tissue. That word describes the shape or the structure. We'll also see trabeculae next semester in the heart. There are also there are noteworthy trabeculae there. They're just little piles, little mounds of tissue. So where these ossification centers meet, the bridges of bone tissue between centers are trabeculae. And that continues to grow. This is spongy bone as it grows outwards. And the outer layer of this spongy bone eventually is replaced. The periosteum will lay down compact bone as a protective blanket on top. 
we have individual centers along this uh, cartilage or, or membranous sheet that each grow and reach out towards neighboring centers. They touch, forming bridges or trabeculae. That spongy material continues to grow outwards, and the upper and lower, the outer surfaces, are gradually replaced with compact bone to protect it from impacts and give it a, a hard surface. This process is the simpler of the two. And you'll see what we're going to talk about in class tomorrow. There's a bit more detail here because we go into a bit more detail in lab here. The process by which uh, long bones form follows a very similar recipe. It's just done on a different axis or more than one axis. So let's leave our discussion there for today, unless there are any questions. No, we'll come back. We'll talk about endochondral ossification in depth.